Let's continue this. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Wasn't sure if it was going to connect or not. Um, but it did. Lucky you. Here we go. <laughs> we have all kinds of things that we're going to share tonight. Um, that we start off uh, with a few of nature's unhuggables, but I tell you, we're going to end with a flourish. So if you'll stick with me for the next hour, uh, hopefully uh, we'll have a lot of fun and uh, maybe we'll learn something along the way too. Hang on here while I get the, uh, the screen share started. Let's go with this one and we'll start it. There we go. Enough of that. Um, if you had a chance to read last week's column, uh, or even if you didn't, this is what we're talking about to start with, it is the rusty crayfish. Um, this is a species you might recall two weeks ago, uh, the column was about the phenomenon of uh, crayfish reproducing and how they, uh, the females will carry um, their little dumplings, their little eggs and then their uh, hatchlings underneath their tail. It's just an endearing little glimpse into the, uh, the maternal nature of these pinchy looking creatures that we have. Well, uh, this past week, I thought we needed to dwell a little bit more um, on this group of animals because we have in our presence, it's, it's actually very common uh, throughout this middle part of the Fox River, um, this uh, introduced species called the rusty crayfish. Now, um, you know, when we think of invasive or introduced and invasive species, uh, our minds tend to go to uh, plants and animals that have come to this country from, uh, from Europe, uh, from Asia, from Eurasia, uh, places that are far off and very different from where we live here. But um, the rusty crayfish, um, I don't think people really thought it was going to be a problem um, because it's from the Ohio River drainage. So just a couple of states east of here, one hour time difference, uh, really very similar latitudes. Um, but it was a, a crayfish that was found to be able to reproduce quickly. And that's important um, in the fish bait uh, industry. Um, when you need to you know, be selling things by the dozen to get your customers out the door so they can go fishing, having uh, crayfish that could be produced cheaply and then you know, sold uh, for a reasonable price, it, was, it sounded like it was a win-win. And it wasn't until later on that um, we started to realize that maybe Rusty's weren't the best choice for uh, the, the uh, bait industry. Um, Rusty's, uh, well, they've look at them. They've, they've got a few advantages over a lot of other crayfish species, uh, our native species. Look at the size of those claws. They're even described in the literature as being oversized. So this is a, a species that quite literally can pack a punch. Um, they uh, also have uh, that those larger claws are accompanied by a bit of an attitude. They tend to be more uh, aggressive or defensive, depending on, on your perspective, but they, they basically, they, they push around our other native species and um, they will displace them. We're finding in areas uh, where we have high concentrations of rusties that we're really not seeing much diversity at all of species. There should be two or, or three other aquatic species present with these rusties and um, we're just not seeing them anymore. Um, and uh, the other thing, they, they reproduce um, you know, more quickly. They tend to have uh, uh, more offspring at one time than our native species. So they, they outcompete them in that way. And then they're, they're uh, pretty general in uh, the opportunistic in the way they feed. So and they're, they're eating, um, the, uh, the same diet, they'll eat the same diet as our native crayfish, but then they'll, they'll supplement that with say uh, fish eggs and um, they'll tear up plants. They, their feeding style is different from our natives too, whereas some of our native species do feed on plants. 
uh, they don't destroy the whole plant, but the rusties with their giant claws and they're just their general, um, you know, kind of overbearing demeanor, they'll rip those uh, plants up by the roots and it, um, you know, it, it clears the vegetation away in some areas. Now, in areas where uh, fishing figures prominently in the economy, and by this I'm talking about, say, Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, those states have even stricter, uh, come down really hard on not just possession of rusties, but also eradication of rusties. Uh, here in Illinois, we know their problem and we are starting to um, track them and, and uh, remove them from areas where they're high in number. But uh, Illinois' economy doesn't depend on good fishing. Uh, you, you might think, well, how are they affecting the fishing if the fish eat them? Well. Sometimes they get so big and they're so ornery that the fish can't eat them. They fight back. Um, I actually saw this uh, a variation on that behavior anyway. Uh, in the turtle pond we have out at Hickory Knolls, um, we had gotten a permit to collect and transport these rusty crayfish and use them as turtle food for the uh, uh, state endangered Blanding's turtles in our pond. And it sounded again, like a win-win. Well, what we didn't count on was that the rusty crayfish fights back. So as these turtles that love crayfish would swim up and try to grab one of these things, the uh, crayfish would be bonking them on the head with those claws and the turtles would spit them out and the rusty crayfish would swim away. So, so there's actually, I think, reduced predation on these animals um, versus our native species because they're just, they're just rough and they're just tough. Um, now, um, Chris, I'm not sure if you're here this week, but the, if you tuned in last week, you might recall the photo on the left. That is um, one, an example of one of our native species. And it was quite large. It was about the size of a men's size 11 foot. That's a big crayfish. But look in comparison. This is a, a white river crayfish. Uh, Acutus is the species name. Um, look at these thin little claws and then compare them. Uh, and these weren't photoshopped, by the way. Um, this picture on the right is a rusty crayfish um, on the side of the turtle pond at Hickory Knolls. Um, I just happened to take it after it had survived a battle uh, with the Blandings. But, um, you know, these, these thinner uh, chili on the um, native species, they don't really stand a chance. If they go, uh, you know, claw to claw, pincher to pincher with the rusty, they're um, going to back down or they're going to lose those claws, which they, they can regenerate over time, but um, they're just not... Um, equipped to, to deal with an invader of this sort. So um, there are different agencies uh, do have plans to have um, uh, means of removing the rusty crayfish uh, from various waterways. In fact, here at St. Charles, we are going to be partnering. Um, it's, the, uh, it's the first Saturday in August, August 7th of this year. We're partnering with our friends at Red Oak Nature Center at the Fox Valley Park District and at Creek Bend Nature Center with the uh, Forest Preserve District. And we are, are participating in the third annual Rusty Rodeo. We'll, we'll be uh, going in, um, the Red Oak folks are going in at Glenwood Park Forest Preserve uh, in Batavia. And we'll be going into the creek at Pearson Creek Park in St. Charles. And the event is from 11 until one that day and our goal is to try and capture as many rusty crayfish as we can, which we will then feed um, to uh, some hungry turtles that we happen to know. Um, after we started publicizing that event, I got a call from someone who is interested in bringing a youth group to the event and she wanted to know, uh, will we be feeding them the crayfish that we catch? And I had to explain that no, they're actually just for, um, uh, the turtles, but uh, rusty crayfish are edible. I would tend to think that there is probably some limitation, just like, you know, there's many stretches of the Fox River where they put a limitation on the number of fish or recommendations, um, the number of fish that are recommended to be consumed out of the river, say, per week or per month, um, because of 
things like PCBs and mercury, uh, heavy metals that, that can be found in certain areas of the river. I would think the same thing would go to crayfish, but, but they are certainly edible and there are a lot of crayfish recipes on the internet. Anything that you see in a touffet or a gumbo that calls for crayfish, you can use um, rusties as uh, an ingredient. You do need uh, a valid Illinois fishing license in order to, um, to capture them, but other than that, go for it. Um, I hear they're quite tasty. Now, um, I get to wondering, that you know, we're hearing all this bad stuff about Rusty's and, and this has been going on now for several years. And I was wondering, is there anything redeemable? I mean, certainly they're, they're, they're not uh, considered to be that problematic, just a couple states over in Ohio. Well, this was some research that was done recently. Uh, and I should state this was all in a, in a controlled laboratory. In, but um, these researchers took a look at um, what uh, the effect of rusty crayfish, not on other native crayfish species, but on uh, the substrate that they inhabit. And it was kind of interesting what they found. They found in the presence of rusty. So here on the top, um, the top two pictures are their control environment, which had no rusty crayfish in it after a two week period. And look at all the fine sediment that collected in this um, laboratory stream setting as they flowed the water through the channel. This is what built up on that substrate. Um, the lower two photos show um, what that substrate looks like in the presence of crayfish. Um, and you can see they, they've, they've kept it kind of tidy and kind of clean. Their movements have reduced the buildup of the sediment. And lo and behold, if we look here at the graph on the right, we see that the macro invertebrate density um, and the taxon richness. Now, what that means is the number of um, insects, aquatic insects, and the type of aquatic insects, the, the uh, number of individuals and then the number of different types, both went up in the presence of rusty crayfish. So again, not native crayfish, but native insects might seem to be deriving a little bit of benefit from having those rusties around. Um, now, they, they talked about some other things uh, in that study. Uh, they talked about uh, other organisms that affect the substrate in um, an area. And they said fish in particular are important substrate engineers uh, that were excluded from our cages, but can influence grain size distributions and entrainment by building reds for eggs or by foraging for food. And I thought reds, the only time I've seen red spelled like that was the comedian red fox. I had to look it up, but it means uh, basically a nest for fish. And you have probably seen these, whether you've realized it or not, especially in our, our streams that might have a fine coating of sediment on them. This was uh, over at Fearson Creek. Look down here on the lower left. You see that, um, how the, the uh, pebbles here are cleaned off? There's one here on the right. In fact, uh, yeah, I've got another picture here. Look how um, all these little tiny stones are clear, cleaned off, even though uh, there's quite a bit of sediment and algae surrounding it. Um, this is where fish will lay their eggs. And so there's quite a bit of uh, you know, activity going down uh, at that substrate level. And um, it's just kind of interesting to consider that uh, much the same way we consider the impact of in, um, uh, introduced earthworms in our area. We don't, you know, we kind of take soil for granted, but there's a lot of movement going on there. There's a lot of processing of nutrients that's happening and uh, the uh, worms are uh, speeding that up. Well, we're seeing something similar now, uh, or the researchers are suggesting we should be seeing something similar now. Uh, when in terms of the substrate in our local streams in the presence of rusties. So anyway, something to, to keep an eye on, uh, something to think about. If nothing else, look for fish nests the next time you're walking alongside a stream because this time of year, especially with the low water levels we're uh, experiencing right now, uh, these should be pretty obvious to see. Pretty neat, huh? 
So, um, so I wrote that column and it wasn't too long after it ran in the newspaper, I got an email and it said, Pam, I didn't know there were different types of crayfish. <laughs> That's all I needed to hear. Oh my bear, everybody, we are gonna go through um, just a, a brief overview of the different types of native crayfish that we have here in Northeastern Illinois, uh, specifically in Kane County. Now, um, there's lots of references for, uh, in fact, statewide, I think we have something like 23 native crayfish species. Um, that book on the right is the least glamorous of the references, but it is the most comprehensive and the most specific to Illinois. It's uh, being kind of old and some of the taxonomy has changed, but it's still handy for keying out different species. Uh, the book in the middle is coffee table size. Um, and the book on the left um, is also a pretty, pretty large uh, reference with color photos. You'll notice that those two are both uh, written or the lead author on both of those is Chris Taylor. He is the Illinois crayfish guy. He's with the Illinois Natural History Survey um, and uh, knows pretty much everything you need to know about crayfish in Illinois and throughout the Midwest. Um, so uh, with that, there's a few key characters if you are so inclined to try and sort out uh, whether you're looking at a rusty or not. Now, rusty crayfish are actually pretty simple. Uh, they've got that rusty red dot that you may have noticed on the side of the carapace. Um, and that's that's really all you, you need to see to know what you're, you're looking at. But if you're going to key out other types of crayfish, some there's some key terms here. The, the areola, which is, is this gap here, between these lines on the carapace. Some um, species have a gap and some don't. Some of those lines connect with no space in between. That's usually something you need to check out. This uh, pointy structure here between the eyes, it's called the rostrum. The rostrum has uh, different sculptures, different structures on it, uh, depending on species. Uh, you might find uh, some spikes here um, leading up to the uh, where the claws are. Um, and then if you remember from last week, remember when we flipped the uh, crayfish over to talk about the males and the females and how the, the, uh, the mamas carry their babies around? Well, uh, these reproductive parts on the male, I, I just made slight reference to them and I'm only going to make slight reference again tonight, but those can become very important if you're trying to identify species. Now in this area, I think most of the crayfish we have, you don't need to get so personal with them. Um, I'm just going to run through uh, the, the northern crayfish is also called the viral crayfish. Um, now, there has been some taxonomy change. Orconectes isn't used anymore. Fixonius is the new uh, genus name for this and other uh, species. Um, but uh, Fixonius virilis is probably the closest relative to the rusty. You'll notice it too has large claws. Um, not coincidentally, this species also interbreeds with um, the rusty crayfish. So we, we might occasionally see uh, crayfish that have characteristics of both species. Um, but they uh, talk about uh, distinct uh, notches on the rostrum. Um, this pair of blotches that run down the abdomen, that's the easiest characteristic to look for, the most obvious characteristic to look for uh, in this area and the one that um, the other species don't have. Uh, the next one, the White River crayfish, that's uh, the one we saw uh, a few photos ago um, that had been spotted out at Nelson Lake Marsh. These, um, what stands out to me with these guys are one, they, they tend to have a very reddish color bright red sometimes, and these narrow, um, narrow uh, pinchers. They, uh, their claws are, are very thin, uh, long and thin. So they, they definitely don't look like they could hold up their, uh, their own weight in a fight. <laughs> um, here's, there's a space, a slight space um, in the, uh, the center of the carapace. Um, and here you'll notice there isn't one. 
So these are the kind of characteristics we're we're not, we're not going to make this into a whole big long crayfish class, but just so you get the idea, here we've got another Orconectes that's now another Fexonia species, the calico crayfish. Um, their rostrum lacks any kind of notches. Um, they've got this sort of delicate pattern that goes down the abdomen and extends onto the tail and is responsible for their name calico. Um, the northern clearwater crayfish also has a dark band, um, much like Acutus did, but um, it extends up onto the abdomen. Um, don't see a lot of this one. Um, most of what we see in this area is the northern crayfish. If it's not a rusty, we're seeing northern crayfish. Um, and then we've go, um, there's a group of crayfish that we have in this area that are much different from these ones we just looked at. These are the burrowing species, the devil crayfish, um, uh, Diogenes, and uh, the prairie crayfish, Gracilis. Look at these claws. And now, they probably could go uh, pincher to pincher with um, a rusty, but again, the rusty is more inclined to do that, and these guys aren't. They're really not looking for a fight. Those claws that they have are used for digging. Um, there's some crayfish that live primarily in water. <clears throat> Those were the first species we looked at. And then there's some species that live primarily on land, but in these burrows. Uh, and they dig down. I mean, you might have seen uh, these little structures here. We call them chimneys. You know, if you're walking, uh, say, near a marsh and you look and you think you're looking at maybe a chipmunk hole, but you know it's much too wet to be a chipmunk. Uh, then it's probably the work of one of our burrowing crayfish. Uh, that devil crayfish and the prairie crayfish are the most common that we have around here, but we have one other one called the digger crayfish um, right there. But we're going to back up for just a second because, uh, yeah, humans dig after these things too. Um, here's a uh, crayfish that's peeking out of its burrow, and then we've got a little video here how they use them. So this was at night. They come out at night to forage. And then it's going back down into its hole. Let's watch that again. You get a glimpse of those enormous claws. And down he goes. So you might be thinking, well, wait a minute. These are aquatic organisms, yet they're living on land. Well, they, they dig down. Those burrows go down till they hit groundwater. Uh, crayfish do breathe through gills, but as long as the gills remain moist, they're able to uh, take in oxygen. The crayfish only gets in real trouble if um, it's removed from the water for a long time and those gills dry out. So it is possible for them to come out of these burrows, uh, again, primarily at night because there's dew, usually unless we're in a drought, <laughs> there's dew on the grass. That's also when they can come out and catch the, uh, the insects and other arthropods that they feed on there on land. So um, kind of cool. Uh, as I mentioned, we do have one other species that's reportedly in this area. I've never found one, the digger crayfish. And then of course our one introduced species in this area, the rusty crayfish. Um, with its rusty red sides, its oversized claws and its major, major attitude. Um, so yeah. There's a couple more taxonomic changes. Uh, Rusty is now considered Faxonius. And then the digger, uh, Phalacambaris, um, there's 2017, there was a major overhaul in, in crayfish taxonomy. So you might occasionally see diggers uh, referred to by this other, uh, I don't even know how to pronounce it, Crisarinus. Um, it's a, a new, uh, or a, a different genus for this particular type of crayfish. Um, this one has got some, some pretty bright markings in that white uh, light colored stripe on the tail. And I've not seen one. And you often do have to go down and dig after them. And I, uh, I haven't done much of that recently. But just keep in mind, yes, we do have different kinds of crayfish in this area, seven native and one non-native, just waiting for you to come out and discover. So now we're gonna we're going to switch gears and we're gonna talk about a body part. 
um, one that, that I had uh, become acquainted with uh, when I started learning about owls years and years ago, I remember looking at an owl skull and looking specifically at the eyes. Um, I, owls' eyes, as we know, they are well adapted to seeing uh, not so much color, but definitely motion at night. Um, and the owl's eye is actually not uh, very round, it's actually sort of tubular. And it's held in place by these structures here, which are called sclerotic rings. Um, so I, I, again, I remember this was years ago, I learned about sclerotic rings in owls and how uh, that holds the eye fixed in place. So when an owl wants to look at something, it has to move its whole head. That's why an owl can move um, 270 degrees. They, they don't go all the way around. If their head goes all the way around, it does fall off and that's no good. So 270 degrees to the right or to the left um, to see their surroundings. You may have seen a bird of prey kind of cocking its head from side to side. That's um, helping it get a good visual um, on its surroundings because the eyeballs don't move. We can move our eyes from side to side or up or down um, because of the muscles um, that we have and the lack of sclerotic rings in our eyes. Mammals don't have these and crocodilians do not have sclerotic rings, but pretty much all other vertebrates have these sclerotic rings in some form. That was kind of new information for me. Um, and it actually prompted me to do some reading. This, look at this, this article was from 1938 in the journal called The Auk. And um, you can actually look it up online there if you so choose. But um, what prompted me to go digging into this or kind of bizarre body part was uh, this. I was walking on a trail and it came across a poor, dearly departed blue jay. Uh, and the, the, the color of the feathers is what drew me over to this part of the trail. But what got me to take the pictures was, looky here, there's a sclerotic ring. Um, it held the bird's eye in place. Um, in fact, if we zoom in a little bit farther, um, it's got over a third to a half of the ring has this sort of extra supportive piece of bone. Well, this 1938 article about sclerotic rings uh, actually called out the uh, rings that are in the eyeballs of jays, including our own blue jays. And how, um, now blue jays are, members of the family Corvidae, which is also the same family that crows are in. But um, crows do not have this extra part on their sclerotic rings. Um, just, unless you're really into bird anatomy, it's not much more than a gee whiz thing, but it, it just shows, you know, the, the closer you look in the, um, the, the more curious you get, the more useless knowledge you can cram inside your head. Now, one other thing, you know, as I was thinking about this, I thought, you know, I wonder how far back does this go? Was this something that, um, you know, came upon with our, our modern fauna or has it been around for a while? Well, it turns out that even dinosaurs like Tyrannosaurus rex had sclerotic rings. Now these things, they're, they're kind of, um, you can see they're little bony plates uh, that kind of stick together, but they tend to come apart fairly easily. So uh, a lot of skeletons are lacking these, but the thinking is that most dinosaurs had eyeballs that were fixed inside their head, just like our modern day birds um, and fish and other vertebrates uh, besides mammals and crocodilians. So kind of cool, huh? Um, next time you see a, a bird on the ground that is no longer living, maybe has been there a few days, take a look, see if you can find a sclerotic ring of your own. So hang on. We have got some shaking. Boy, this, uh, this comes from Miss Bonnie and her son Jay out in Kendall County. Uh, this was uh, this past weekend, uh, rocking and rolling and um, 
check this out. So this is a fox snake that had um, found its way in front of uh, Jay's garage. And I'm gonna turn up the sound as high as I can get it here. All right, we're gonna see. Um, this is a fox snake and this, this is a, a local non-venomous species. Um, they are unfortunately though often killed because of a defensive behavior that they have. Check this out, we're gonna play this video. Can you hear that buzz? Oh, couple interesting things there. Um, so the tail is rattling and that is something that fox snakes do. In fact, corn snakes do that, bull snakes do that. Uh, you don't have to have a rattle and fangs to, uh, to shake your tail in defense. Um, but this snake uh, was, was clearly saying, hey, back off, I'm just passing through here. But what I thought was really interesting was that it stopped rattling when Jay said hello. And everything I've ever read about snakes is that their hearing is very poor. They have no external ear. Um, much of what they sense is through vibrations. And maybe it was just the vibration of his voice, uh, but on concrete. Now, let's watch this again and listen. If you didn't have your sound up, turn it up. Listen to the rattle. And you can see it there, right in the, the expansion gap there in the concrete. It's just buzzing back and forth. It's funny, on, on the one hand, I think that the snake is, you know, trying to fade into the background, but on the other hand, its tail is buzzing. Um, you know, just, just hitting against the, uh, the dry grass and the two sides of the, uh, uh, the gap there in the concrete. And um, it's just, just a great example of a local species doing what it does, you know, and it's just wants to get along on its way, wasn't acting threatening, wasn't trying to guard any territory or anything, probably just been out enjoying the, the warm day. Um, and actually, now that I'm thinking about it, we had some really warm days this weekend. And if I recall correctly, Miss Bonnie, this was this past weekend, um, it was so hot that um, you know, reptiles, they're cold blooded, so they do need to warm up, but they do, uh, especially in this area, there is an upper limit to what they can tolerate. I'm almost wondering if this snake craw crawled out onto the concrete, not to warm up, but to cool down. Just a thought. We have one more video uh, from a different angle that we're gonna watch here. Keep your eye on that tail. can't quite hear it as well, but look at the, the rapid vibrations, the, the shaking going back and forth, the, the shaking and the quaking uh, of this um, fox snake that um, lived happily ever after, I'm glad to say. But appreciate those videos, Bonnie. Those were awesome. Now, um, we were talking um, about green herons a while back, and um, then it came to my attention that there is another bird in the area that is somewhat similar. So I thought it might be fun to do a heron comparison. So on um, our left here, we have the black crown night heron, which is, uh, I just double checked this right before the program started. It is still considered endangered in Illinois. Um, it's funny though, around here, I, I actually run into them fairly often. Uh, I see them by the Batavia Dam and uh, upstream of the Batavia Dam by the Batavia Boathouse. I've seen them at Fermi Lab. Uh, there's a couple of ponds. In fact, I saw them in a, a drainage um, that's at the corner of Kirk, I'm sorry, at uh, Peck and uh, Kesslinger Roads. Uh, it's the, uh, what would that be? The Southeast corner. It's uh, would be across the road from uh, animal control, but so they, you know, they pop up in weird places. That one was standing on a storm grate um, fishing. Uh, on the right, we have our green heron. And you can see there's some, some similarities in shape. Uh, the bill uh, of the green heron is a little bit straighter. 
Um, but the coloring is different. The green heron has definite uh, greens, greenish grays, and it has that rusty brown uh, breast to it. Whereas the, uh, the night heron is white and gray, um, the, a little bit more monochromatic in terms of color. Uh, one thing though, and uh, Jerry, I have to thank you for your photos of the um, black crown night heron. Uh, Jerry took this photo um, along, I believe it was the Chicago River. You got a great shot here of the feet of the black crown night heron. And looky here, just like what we talked about with the green heron, there is a partial webbing between the middle and outer toes of the black crown night heron. I think that's, that's kind of cool. And it shows these birds are definitely related. Um, that webbing is there, it, it can help them if they're waiting in um, say the kind of uh, muck or silt where a human would just sink down to you know, our knees or our hips, <laughs> depending on how deep the sedimentation is. This kind of helps them tread in those areas without sinking as deeply, sort of like a snowshoe. But then it will also give them a little advantage if they've perhaps waded out too far and they have to swim back again that can, uh, act as kind of a, a um, webbing like a, a, you know, on a duck's foot. So kind of dual purpose on the feet there. And both of these birds have them. They made me curious as to just how closely related they are. And as it turns out, they are uh, in the same family, uh, which is the, the heron family, uh, but they are different uh, genera. Uh, Nycticorax actually means um, night heron. <laughs> so that was a pretty appropriate name for the night heron. Um, and then Buteroides <laughs> is uh, the um, genus for the green heron. Um, and that is, uh, th there used to be just one bird in that genus, and then they split it up um, based on they found that it wasn't just regional variations, that there were actually different species and the green heron is fluorescence. So um, uh, pretty closely related, share some familial traits, um, but also different species. Um, think about that when you're looking at uh, wading birds of which we have quite a few, again, with our low water levels of lots of picking going on in uh, the shallows along our creeks and our streams, uh, see if you can spot uh, a green heron and then see if you can spot a state endangered black crown night heron. Good luck. So uh, instead of throwback Thursday, we're gonna do a throwback Tuesday. If you've been tuning in to Good Natured Hour for the last, oh gosh, this goes back to last November. So kind of a while. Uh, you might remember that there was a very beleaguered Ohio Buckeye at the Batavia Wildflower Sanctuary down in downtown Batavia. Um, the, uh, the uh, bring up your speed if you don't recall this, this was a uh, tree that was being chewed not by a, a beaver, by the, you know, the, the you know, most common suspect when a tree gets chewed on. Um, look at where this chewing was occurring. It was up on the branches of the tree. And as it turns out, um, it was a uh, fox squirrel. Fox squirrels are known to chew on Ohio buckeyes to derive uh, sweetness. This happens uh, when they don't find their usual fall crop, uh, mass crop. They, they, they're, they're not collecting enough acorns or walnuts, and they will go to alternate food sources like the uh, sweet um, interior pith of the um, uh, Ohio buckeye. So um, our stewards down at the Wildflower Sanctuary, Sarah and Terry, were kind of worried about this tree. They sort of gave it up um, for being gone because it had sustained so much damage. Let's take a closer look. I mean, to get to the pith, which is in the center of these branches, the squirrel had to destroy all of the outer layers to get in there. And, um, and there wasn't much hope that this tree was going to survive, but I was down there last week and lo and behold, it's back. It's, it's a little worse for wear. You can see some of these branches are a little wonky, but it leafed out. 
uh, you know, that shows that all of the important layers in the trunk, the, uh, the inner bark and the cambium and the sapwood are still allowing nutrients and water to flow up and down. And um, the tree is hanging in there. So uh, we'll see what happens again this fall if the fox squirrel comes back, if it's developed this taste for pith and it can't uh, get enough. Um, but it was kind of neat to see that this tree had, uh, had survived and is actually looking pretty good. Um, now, since I was in Batavia, um, I thought it might be good to do a little time travel. Um, Batavia, just like uh, Geneva, St. Charles, Aurora, Elgin, all these river towns, um, that's where these towns built up first because a river was a source of transportation. The river provided a means of power, whether it was turning the wheels of uh, say a grist mill or a sawmill or a little bit later on, uh, the wheels of power generators, uh, electric generators. Um, rivers were very important, not to mention things like drinking water in a place to throw away your trash. Um, so, so this is a map of uh, Batavia in 1869. And we see that uh, even back then it had uh, just one bridge uh, at Wilson Street right here. Uh, some things have changed over time. Uh, you, know, you can see Back in the day, there, um, the river kind of divided and flowed past all these islands here. Since then, um, this area has been filled in. A depot pond was created. Um, and I've always heard that uh, the McDonald's in Batavia is actually sitting on uh, landfill. So um, it, if that kind of helps orient you um, to what present day Batavia looks like, let's see, McDonald's would probably be right here. So this is all filled in. Depot Pond would occur over here. Um, and here's a dam. Um, it's got kind of a curve to it. Uh, you can see it's quite a distance north of Wilson Street. In fact, let's focus in on it here. This is the dam that uh, connected, uh, that, this is River Street here. And um, I would imagine this was some sort of mill or something here, right alongside the river. So this is 1869 Batavia. Oh, here's a look at modern day Batavia. Um, here's uh, the Wilson Street Bridge. And here is the uh, present Batavia Dam that is, uh, well, it's going to take itself off if, out if they can't come to agreement on uh, how it should be uh, managed. It just is getting more and more crumbly. Um, but it was built to uh, provide power for the Challenge Windmill Factory when it was in operation. And um, it's created kind of a lake-like quality to the water north of the, uh, the dam. And in years of normal rainfall, this is pretty much what it looks like. But um, we did make up a little bit this uh, past couple of nights with our rain, but we're still running at a deficit. And when I was there last Friday, the water was very, very low. Uh, this is a view looking, um, this is the present Batavia Dam here on the right. And then this is looking upstream and look at this. There's this curved structure here uh, Sarah and Terry said that Mayor Schilke had given them a little um, walk and talk uh, next to the wild, uh, wildflower sanctuary. And he said, that is the remains of the 1869 dam. I thought that was so cool. I went and walked up to it. Um, I don't know if I was violating any safety protocols. You're not supposed to walk on dams, but this one looked like it was pretty safe and pretty stable. Um, these are the remains of the 1869 dam. And when you look at these pieces here, you can see there's busted up pieces of limestone. That is what that original dam was built from. Uh, now I juxtaposed, I flipped the image around so that the curve matched because I was standing on the, uh, the west side of the river. So um, that building there, uh, couldn't figure out how to move that. I'm not a, much with Photoshop, but um, that curve, um, that early dam had a curve. And now I haven't been down there since we had a rain, so I don't know if it's still visible, but uh, probably shouldn't be too hard to see. And it might be worth checking out because once we get back to our normal rainfall levels, it'll probably 
uh, disappear under the water again. But kind of cool, might be something you wanna go check out. Now, while I was down there, I, those of you who know me know I'm kind of a freak when it comes to freshwater mussels. And I just hated the thought of all the death and destruction that this drought is bringing upon our little mussel friends. Um, some of them are just outright drying up because they're stranded on a gravel bar or a sandbar out in the middle of the river. But a lot of them are being predated um, by well, primarily raccoons, but um, birds are also cracking these things open and uh, muskrats too uh, are taking advantage of this bounty. So I found a lot of dead, cracked open, busted open mussel shells. But um, I was sitting on a log and I was watching a um, young a fledgling red-winged blackbird begging from its papa and uh, the bird was being pretty insistent and the uh, dad was doing its best to provide for its needs. Um, and I got kind of wrapped up in that drama and then I looked down and what did I see? But this is a, um, a giant floater and it was stranded and I thought it was dead. Um, but I thought, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to check and see. And I, I picked it up and it had some heft to it. Um, and then I tried to pry it open and I couldn't. And that's an indication. Sometimes you pick it up and it's got a heft to it and you open it and you get uh, black silty mud all over your pants and your feet because it was uh, loaded with gunk. But this, I could not pry it open. So that's a good sign that the animal inside was still alive. So I walked it over to this riffle. This is not the dam. You can see we're, we're actually below the, uh, the current Batavia Dam here. This was just a, um, an area that probably is, is invisible uh, when the water is higher, but it was, it, there was a decent flow here. There was some oxygenation going on. So I, I walked out here and I gave the uh, little mussel a, a, a gentle toss and let's all keep our fingers crossed that it's gonna thrive there um, in the water that it desperately needed. So uh, if you go down to check out the dam, uh, also check out uh, what's laying stranded in the gravel there and uh, you might be able to rescue a mussel too. So uh, we're going to wrap up with one reader email. Um, this was kind of neat and it's um, just a reminder that these things are here and they show up uh, when they're least expected. Um, this was um, a family, they live up in uh, South Elgin. Um, near Five Islands Park. And they said that we had cut a tree down about five years ago. And I wanted to keep the stump, which is now rotting. I've done this too, uh, just to see if, you know, if you're getting a tree cut down, if, if you can uh, spare the space, it's nice to not have the stump ground out and just leave, um, you know, leave it, you know, maybe up to 10 or 12 feet tall, whatever your neighbors will tolerate and see what comes to it. This is this works really well with native species, especially oaks. Uh, as I learned, it doesn't work really well with Norway maples. Those are better off just removed. But um, uh, I don't know what kind of tree this was, but um, this was uh, a, a bird that actually came into the yard and was taking advantage of all the decomposers, the, the ants and the beetle grubs that are now living in this dead tree. Um, there he is. This is um, a male pileated woodpecker just hacking away uh, on this tree. Look at, um, I've heard that this is one of the species that was an inspiration for uh, woody woodpecker, you know, with that crown. Um, he's got the, uh, the red mustache there. And then this powerful beak. Uh, you know, they, they dig, and when a, when a pileated goes at rotten wood, there is no mistaking their work. They will leave generally uh, rectangular shaped holes. They almost look like the same um, shape and size of holes that you'll see like on a, a uh, split rail fence um, where the fence has posts and then the rails are in between. Those holes that the rails fit in um, often remind me of a pileated or pileated work reminds me of those fence posts. But uh, Big birds, 
um, leave some unmistakable marks and um, they are out there. Um, Take it with the Woods Forest Preserve, uh, Norris Woods Nature Preserve here in St. Charles, uh, Leroy Oaks along Fearson Creek, lots and lots of uh, places where they are being sighted. But this is one of the more recent ones. Uh, if you happen to be along the bike trail, uh, the Fox River Trail, um, going past Tekawitha and John Dewar Forest Preserve, might be worth it to get off your bike and, and pay a listen, look at a few trees, um, see what you can find, because they're here. So cool. All right, uh, just a brief look at next week's lineup. We're gonna be um, sort of wrapping up our look at crayfish with um, a view of one of the local predators that specializes in eating crayfish, that is the queen snake. Um, we're gonna delve into the topic of solitary wasps. You know, wasps have a, a not so great reputation. There's a lot of memes out there that, uh, call them nature's bleeps uh, because of their tendency to sting uh, first and ask questions later. That generally refers to yellow jackets, which uh, yes, are a type of wasp. Um, solitary wasps, so they're much different. They're in the same order, but um, they don't have a colony to defend. So they're much less aggressive. And oftentimes the key to identifying them isn't just looking at them, but also looking at what they're feeding on, uh, because that will give you a clue as to um, what species they are. Gonna get, I uh, have some more cool reader emails and who knows else, what, what else is gonna come down the pike over the next week. So um, appreciate you hanging in there tonight. I'm gonna stop the share now. I think we had a couple of chats that we needed to attend though, uh, to. Um, are our native crayfish related to lobsters? Yes, they are. Uh, Decapoda is the group that they all belong to, and they are sometimes called freshwater lobsters. Um, they, there's not nearly as much meat on a crayfish. You have to catch a lot more to fill your bellies, but yes, they are uh, related to the two. Um, and yes, there are a lot of different species. Um, um, Corn Farm does have a creek and it, wherever they feel, and, and you know, it's interesting because you might be walking along and not even cognizant that there's groundwater, you know, fairly near the surface, but these burrows, uh, three feet is considered kind of average, but sometimes it's six feet or more that they burrow down, which is why the burrowing species have those big, tough looking claws. Um, any nice photography, yes. <laughs> um, Diane said that uh, many of the crayfish or grandkids captured uh, temporarily, good job, behind Creek Bend were missing a claw or both. Have they been doing battle with each other? Uh, yes, that's oftentimes that will happen. And yes, the claw will regenerate, but it, it takes several molds. Crayfish, um, they don't have an internal skeleton. They do have an exoskeleton, uh, much like our insects and uh, spiders. So to grow, they need to molt or shed that exoskeleton. And as the sheds, as they go through sequential molts, that uh, claw will start to regenerate. Now, um, that does remind me, sometimes you know, you'll be walking along and you'll look in the water and you're like, oh, there's a lot of dead crayfish. A lot of times those crayfish aren't actually dead. Um, it's just the cast skin. And you can, you can tell the difference by picking it up and seeing if any guts are inside. I guess that's only if you're really curious about it. But yeah, um, they do molt and um, they leave that cast skin behind and that does help in the regeneration process. Um, are sclerotic rings bone or cartilage? They are bone, Carol. Um, little plates of bone. Um, and it sort of depends on the species, how those are put together, if they're more um, solidified into just one ring or if there are many pieces that are uh, kind of overlapping and held together by the surrounding muscles and tissue. But yeah, it's a, it's a weird little thing that I, I had only associated with owls and here it turns out just about everything has them except for mammals and, and crocodiles. <laughs> um, and Kim wanted to point out that Ohio buckeyes are pretty resilient. I had planted one at Fine Lane inside St. Charles last summer, didn't get the cage on soon enough, so it had deer brows. And today you want to take the fencing um, 
and there was growth that um, declared its Ohio buckeye. So the root was intact and is now creating a new tree. So it, it just shaved it off, huh, Kim? Um, but the tree is still growing. Yeah, they, they could have, maybe this is something, it might be new to us, but it might be something that Buckeyes have been dealing with for millennia, you know, black squirrels and deer and other things. I guess if you've got a sweet pith, you've got to be able to regenerate because uh, there's sooner or later, there's going to be something that discovers it and wants to go after it. Um, oh, and Beth has a cedar house that the woodpeckers love to put holes in. Um, you heard one that sounded like a jackhammer. You know, um, Beth, was it was it a um, was like was it a slow pounding or was it a like a repeating sound? Um, I don't know if this will answer the question of what kind it was, but they birds will peck on houses for different reasons. If it's a slow and random pecking, that's a feeding behavior and they're sensing that there's something for them to eat in that wood. And sometimes, you know, um, Jerry Hope, uh, the late Jerry Hope of King County Audubon, he taught me uh, this trick and it, it's turned out to be true on a number of calls that we've gotten here. Um, if there's an old, uh, an antique clock hanging on an exterior wall and you find that you have woodpeckers pecking on the outside of that wall, um, move the clock because an antique clock or antique clock that's still running, um, as its gears move, the sound that they make sounds very similar to the sounds that uh, a beetle larvae will make as they're chewing the wood in your house. Um, so uh, woodpeckers hear the sound of those clock gears and they start pecking, trying to find the insect when really there's nothing there at all. It's just grandma's clock. So. Um, so that's one reason that the birds could be on the house. Uh, another one um, is if they're trying to make a hole, and that is uh, more concentrated, but also a slower pecking as they're um, knocking and then removing bits of wood. But if it's a drumming sound, um, they're just using it to declare their territory. Uh, Pileated on a house, I don't know. I don't know that I've ever seen that, but I don't know if that, I mean, I mean that doesn't mean it couldn't happen. Um, it was not slow. Um, so yeah, I would, I would say it's a, it's a woodpecker that's drumming, which that happens when they are, are breeding. So either they're now starting a second clutch or one is looking for a mate or they're warning other woodpeckers to stay away from their babies. Those are all things that they do because their voices don't really carry all that far, but um, their drumming does. So if it was like a and um, another thing that um, sometimes they don't drum on wood, but they'll drum on gutters or they'll drum on the flash by your chimneys, that can be very loud too. So that's a really long answer. And I don't know if it even answers your question, but it uh, gives you some things to think about. Uh, if there's a pileate in your area, chances are um, somebody's gonna spot it because they're about the size of a crow. Um, and Kay wanted to know, are pileates the only um, woodpeckers that create those huge holes? Yes. Well, and huge, by huge, we're talking about, um, you know, like, say the size of a, what is it, like a long john donut? Um, that would be an, an average size hole for a woodpecker. Um, now, uh, pileated, their nest hole is, uh, boy, I'm in a kind of a donut mood, a, you know, the size of a small donut for the pileated nest hole. Um, that does tend to be kind of rounded, um, but the, uh, the holes that they make in foraging are generally jagged and rectangular in shape. Um, and Wallace has got Downies um, drumming and making holes in the siding. Yeah, you know, I cut the Downies a break. Um, I had one on the south side of my house. Um, and I just let it stay there over the winter. They do create uh, winter uh, excavations too, in addition to making holes for um, nest holes. Uh, they'll make shelter holes in the wintertime. And I, I let the little guy stay there in the winter and then I filled it in uh, when summer came, when I knew he wasn't in there anymore. If you don't fill those holes in, um, one, it's not so great for your house. And two, a lot of times starlings will move in and that's not so welcome either. 
Um, anybody else? Any questions or comments for the good of the group? If not, uh, I got to tell you all, thanks so much for tuning in tonight. Um, hopefully, we'll see you back again next week. And um, have a great week. Uh, sounds like we might get a little bit more rain, too. So um, that's all good as well. But if you do want to go see that Batavia Dam, get down there before we get too many more inches. Okay. All right. Have a great rest of your week, everyone. Take thanks, care. Pam. Thank you. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, Pam. Bye.